Any questions, uh, comments? Okay, so NFC, oh yeah. Yes. Um, you can't really amplify the chip itself because it's really very, very tightly integrated. Um, but if you have a, a, a good antenna, for example, then you can also, so you can power it from a longer distance, uh, from, a, from a higher distance, and you can also detect the response over a, a longer distance. So I, I think there are also tags which are by design uh, have a longer range, but most of the, of the tags you can just buy uh, for 20 cents or something, they don't have that. So they only really, the tag itself, when paired with, uh, with a standard reader, then it can just um, reach for two or three centimeters. Okay, so um, just a few comments about security with respect to NFC tags. So if you actually have a public tag embedded somewhere, then of course that should be write protected because then otherwise some, some funny person might just change the URL that's in there and maybe even point you to some site that contains malware. Might be possible. So uh, the standard actually has provisions for write protecting the tags, um, but uh, it's, often just, it's often just overlooked. So uh, if you come across a public tag, then you should always be a little wary if the, the data in that tag really is yeah, genuine, basically. Um, so there are a couple of security measures. Um, even the, the most simple NFC tags can have read and write protection for, uh, for their sectors and actually have dedicated keys for each sector and so on. But um, it's of course still possible to, to attack this and for example just brute force those keys because the cards simply don't have any protection against that. Uh, on the other hand, if you really need uh, a higher level of security, and for example, the Tosca does this in a, in a proper way, then you can use this uh, a card with a really, with a crypto coprocessor, which does all the uh, crypto communication for you, and which is also resistant, like we already talked about, to, to tampering, to brute forcing, and so on. So um, this, uh, crypto processor does all the hard work, basically. Uh, of course, it's a little more expensive uh, than just having a tag for, for 20 cents. Yes? Is this possible for, for, for us, for example, to imitate like uh, an NFC, for example, like imagine that like, I'm taking Tosca and read it, and then with my mobile, imitate the same uh, data, and then yeah. I can't be able to identity? Yes, you could, but that's the, the uh, interesting part here. The Tosca also contains a, a really hardened crypto part and you can't read that one with your, with your regular phone. So that can only be read by, for example, the, um, the uh, like uh, how, to, how to call them, the vending, vending machines in the Mensa, for example. They have the right key to com communicate with the secure part on the Tosca and your phone doesn't. And for that reason, you can only look at very basic information with your phone. Um, but in theory, if you had that key from the, from the vending machine, then you might be able to actually read out the entire data from somebody else's uh, Tosca and make a copy of it. Yes, yes. It's, Bi-directional, yeah. Okay, so are there any further questions regarding NFC tags? <clears throat> if not, then 
let's briefly look back at the issues I discussed in the first place. So um, the one big issue I already mentioned is the energy supply. And um, one possible solution would be to do some kind of energy harvesting from the environment. And there's actually lots of possible sources. So you can have, of course, light, just like with these old calculators, which are, had a small solar cell. Um, you could also use things like vibration and sound. And this might actually make sense, for example, if you want to put sensors onto some kind of industrial machine, because then there will be vibration and movement, and you can actually, might actually be able to use that to, to power your sensor. Um, you can actually use temperature differences. Again, if you have some kind of something that actually gets hot, some machine, then you can put the sensor there and use the difference between the hot part and the cold environment to generate electricity. Yes, please. Um, yes, this is actually the, the, the next part is some, somewhat related to that. So the wireless charging in smartphones, um, uh, that's also again optimized for a very short distance and lots of power. So this is not something that uh, would, would be uh, interesting for this kind of sensors. Uh, for the sensors, you would need a lot uh, less power, but over a longer range. Um, what's been done, there are some, some um, prototypes which do that, are simply uh, use the energy in the Wi-Fi signals from the, from the access point here in the room, for example, to actually power the sensor. And then after you've collected enough energy, then you can actually send back one single Wi-Fi packet, for example. So this is uh, using electromagnetic magnetic radiation that's already present in the environment, like just the, the signals from the Wi-Fi router. Um, in, at the most basic level, that's actually similar to the wireless charging on the phone because that also uses electromagnetic fields, but it's optimized for a different scenario. So again, for the, for the charging, you need lots of energy, but you can have a very, very short range. And for the sensor, these kind of sensors, you need just a very, very small amounts of energy, but um, over a lot longer range. And again, yeah, there have been already sensor prototypes which use either TV uh, signals or Wi-Fi signals to just gather a few microwatts of energy and then uh, at some point also transmit back again. So, um, problem here with this whole approach of, to energy harvesting is of course that you can at the very best get a few uh, 10 or maybe 100 milliwatts of power out of this without having to construct some kind of large solar panel. And um, the power often isn't also available continuously. So if you use light, then of course uh, uh, at night or when nobody's in the room, then it will be dark and then your sensor won't have any energy anymore. And for that reason, you would also have to design some kind of energy storage uh, for this to work. So still, still an ongoing research topic. Um, so we already talked about privacy. Uh, one aspect is, for example, if you have some kind of fitness tracker which regularly broadcasts its, uh, its advertisements, then you can, um, uh, for example, use that to actually track a person. It, and it would uh, work even better than um, with, a, with a smartphone um, because these uh, low energy devices are actually designed to broadcast uh, their, their presence over and over again, uh, uh, depending on the, on the configuration. Um, there is a provision built into Bluetooth low energy into the standard that the MAC address that they use to broadcast can be random. And that would, of course, defeat this. But um, for this to work, the manufacturer has to actually turn it on. And if they don't, then you might actually have a problem again. So if you have uh, enough um, yeah, 
listening stations, so to speak, uh, around, then you might be able to make very detailed profiles of how people move just because they carry some kind of, of low energy device. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the things and the same time the security. So you, I mean, if you run them, then that's how you can identify them. Yeah, the, the idea is that you just, if it's implemented properly, then you need to turn on these, these broadcasts only if you want to create the connection for the first time. And then, for example, you, can, you just have to assume that in this short time window, your device, your fitness tracker is the only one which is currently being turned on within 10 meters. Um, and afterwards, then the uh, device wouldn't have to broadcast anymore. Uh, so that's the, the, how it's supposed to work. But there have been uh, cases where the manufacturer simply made a mistake and the devices have continued to broadcast even after they had been already connected with a, with a phone. And um, if something like that happens, then of course you can use it to, to track people around. Um, so in theory, if everybody followed the standard as it's in, uh, quite intended to be, then this wouldn't work. But yeah, there have been cases where people simply have made mistakes or didn't care, and then the devices have continued to broadcast even if they shouldn't. And that's then, of course, a, a privacy problem. Okay, so final um, issue I already mentioned is uh, standards. So. I briefly mentioned this. Uh, of course, you can get smart light bulbs from lots of companies by now, but you always need a, a dedicated app to actually control them. So um, there is a little bit of common ground. Most of these devices use Wi-Fi, and on top of Wi-Fi, they use IP, but that's it. The rest of the control protocol is very often something built entirely on their own by the company. There are a couple of standards. Um, you can, of course, use something like HTTP. There's also MQTT, which is interesting for sensors. Um, there are some uh, systems which use Zigbee, but the, the big problem remains that everybody is basically constructing their own tiny little ecosystem and not caring about talking to, to anybody else. Um, there's a, a recent approach by Google, which is called the physical web, or also URI beacons. And here the idea is that every smart object uh, simply has a, a broadcast built in. Um, and again, of course, privacy problem. And in that broadcast, you would have an, a URL. And then you can use that URL to control that uh, smart device, so you can, Basically, you just need the browser or some very simple front end to control the device. But here again, the problem is, uh, or one of the problems would be the mapping. So if you have like, I don't know, uh, 15 smart light bulbs here in the room, um, then I immediately get uh, 15 different URLs on my device and now which one is which light bulb and what's the mapping? So that's also something which is kind of an unsolved question. How do I actually, uh, how would I map this uh, information to the real world again? And this is, I think this is also part of the bigger question I already mentioned in the beginning, that there isn't really a, a proper interaction concept available right now for how do I actually interact with all these hypothetical smart devices in my environment. Um, how would I turn on the lights if uh, everything is Wi-Fi connected and there's no switch anymore? So this is really a very fundamental question and one that would uh, also, I think, have a lot of impact on how people are, how willing people actually are to, to use these kinds of, of environments. All right. Um, yeah, we're basically done for today. Are there any Further questions?
Yeah, one more. Well, that's uh, health issues. I think it's an open question. I've recently read of a, of a study which, um, the, so there has been one lo really long-term study over 25 years which concluded that um, the radiation from, from cell phones and, and Wi-Fi and so on, 2.4 gigahertz, uh, is not in any way harmful to human health. And right now there has been another study, I think from Australia, who have, uh, I think, subjected rats to very high levels of, of uh, cell phone radiation. And these rats got uh, cancer at a higher rate. So um, I think there is no proper answer to that question. Um, I think the, all of the scenarios I've seen so far uh, basically assume even those where, which conclude that there are some harmful effects, they always assume that you have the uh, device right next to your head so that the radiation actually goes more or less directly into your brain. Uh, but in the case of all these Internet of Things uh, applications, the devices wouldn't actually be very close to you. So they're maybe at your wrist or maybe somewhere in the environment. And um, because of the, of even if it's just one meter of distance, then the, um, the radiation energy already drops so, qu so quickly that I don't think that there are any, any health effects from this. So I think the one big question which still remains is if you make lots of phone calls and have your phone at the, right next to your, to your head all the time, then over 10, 20, 30 years that might have some bad negative effects, but nobody really knows for sure, as far as I know. Yes? Um, also, I've heard kind of stuff where they put uh, plants next to the Wi-Fi router mm -hmm. and somewhere else and uh, compare how those plants develop. And plants next to Wi-Fi router developed, didn't develop uh, that good. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. All right, so if there aren't any further questions, then we're done for today. Yeah, thanks for listening and see you next week, I guess.